Good for me. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's National Geographic Explorer Classroom. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I will be your host for today. I want to welcome our classrooms joining us from Canada and the United States, as well as any classrooms who will be joining us live on YouTube today. So I'm really excited to be joined today by Brian Scary. Brian is an underwater photographer, and he's logged well over 10,000 hours underwater. He's been on assignment all over the world from the wild oceans of New Zealand uh, with right whales to the Arctic Ocean uh, with harp seals. So Brian's had dozens of stories uh, and covers with National Geographic and recently last summer had a series of stories uh, on sharks run in National Geographic magazine. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Brian's going to share some of his uh, photos and stories from uh, diving with sharks around the world. So Brian, as always, it's great to have you joining us for Explore Classroom. And uh, yeah, you're a pro by now. So many hangouts with classrooms all over the place. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Joe. It's great to be back with Explore Classroom. And hi, everybody. Um, talking to you from my studio, my office in the state of Maine, in southern Maine, near the ocean. And um, as Joe just mentioned, I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about my work with sharks. Now, you know, sharks are a subject that seem to get a lot of attention. And I think a big part of that is because we perceive them as very dangerous animals. And they are predators. They are, you know, potentially dangerous animals. But my work as a photojournalist, as somebody who uses pictures to tell stories, has sort of evolved over the years. I've been diving with sharks for several decades now. I think I made my very first dive with a shark in 1982, a very long time ago. And um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about those early days and then show you what I've been up to today. So I think the best thing to do is for me to just stop talking with just my face here and, and actually show some pictures. So um, let me um, do what I need to do here, Joe. So what's, um, what's the first step now that I've got the keynote sort of in front here? Yeah, if you move your cursor to the left, there should be a little pop-up menu. And the second one down is a green rectangle uh, for screen share. Okay, yep. And Got then it. if you pick the option for your whole screen, we should be in business. Whole screen, okay, share, let's try that. And do we see, do we see the presentation or? We are good, sharks, full screen, perfect. All right. Great. All right. So, you know, um, as I just mentioned, I began diving with sharks many years ago in 1982 was my very first dive with sharks. And, you know, back then when I was just barely out of my teens or just 20 years old, I, I think a big part of why I was interested in diving with sharks is because I thought it would be really cool to be close to a, a big, potentially dangerous predator. I think there's something about predators that just intrigue human beings, you know, whether it's a grizzly bear or a lion in Africa or tigers or whatever the predator is, I think humans are interested in these big, you know, predatory animals. And it was no different for me as a, as a teenager or 20 year old kid that wanted to get in the ocean and be close to predators. But over time, my view sort of changed. You know, that very first experience that I had with a shark, it was actually a blue shark back then, and that very first dive with a shark, it, it had a, a profound effect on me in the sense that I realized that these weren't particularly dangerous or threatening animals. They, it certainly wasn't to me. It was an animal that was actually a little tricky to get close to. It was not interested in me particularly. And I began to see sharks as something really beautiful. And as a photographer, the years after that, I, I was interested in just trying to make beautiful pictures of sharks. You know, for me, they they had this perfect symmetry. This this photo that I'm showing you right now, this is an animal called an oceanic white tip shark. And I'll talk about that in a few moments in a little greater detail. But you know, you see a picture like this and you see how perfectly sculpted they are, that evolution has sculpted them to be perfect for whatever habitat they might inhabit in the ocean. You know, this is a blue shark like that very first one that I saw on my first scuba dive with a shark many years ago. And, you know, to me, an animal like this 
reminded me of an aircraft. You know, it had a very long, slender fuselage-like body, like the body of an aircraft. It had these big wing-like pectoral fins that helps it glide through the ocean. So as a photographer, I was interested in making pictures that really accentuated the beautiful shapes that sharks have. And to show them, you know, as something extraordinary, no matter where in the ocean they lived. I also became very interested in the, the sort of amazing abilities that sharks have. You know, this is a portrait of a, another oceanic white tip shark, but the reason I wanted to show this photo is because we can see the shark's eye very clearly in this picture. And I wanted to talk about some of the senses that sharks have. You know, sharks have extremely good eyesight, uh, particularly in low light. You know, I think many of us have heard that cats for example, can see good in the dark, that cats can see good in very low light, but a shark can actually see twice as good as a cat in dark conditions, in nighttime or dark, dark uh, with very little light. And if you look carefully in this picture, you'll also notice that sort of underneath the shark's nose on, on the snout of the shark, you'll see all these little dots, like these little pores, and those are actually another sensory device that sharks have sort of evolved to have. It's called the ampullae of Lorenzini, kind of a long and weird name. But what that means is that these sharks, or sharks in general, have developed electroreceptors. They have little nerve endings in their nose that can actually pick up electrical impulses. So what that means is that a shark can actually detect a heartbeat in a prey fish or if they're hunting in murky water where they can't really see very well because it's really dirty water they can actually home in on the, sh the heartbeat of the prey fish because they can sense that that's how amazingly advanced that they are and you know there's only a handful of sharks that sort of get talked about sort of the the big scary sharks but in reality there's over 500 species of sharks in our world's oceans and they've all evolved a little bit differently to you know depending on which habitat which ecosystem they live in so even individual body parts have evolved to be very unique and specialized for what the shark is going to eat let's say so this is a photo that i made of a sand tiger shark i photographed this one in japan and you can see that big mouthful of sort of pointy slender teeth well, this is a sand tiger shark, and those teeth work very well for the kind of things that a sand tiger shark eats. But a regular tiger shark, just a regular tiger shark, not a sand tiger shark, has a very different tooth structure, a triangular serrated tooth that's used for eating different kinds of prey. You know, they predate on things like sea turtles or many different kinds of prey. So their teeth have evolved to be very differently. So again, as a photographer and a storyteller with pictures, I'm always looking for ways to sort of celebrate sharks and show that they're really something that we should be amazed at and that they have this incredible magnificence. Also, as I said, there's over 500 species of sharks and not all of them have big teeth and are really scary predators. The largest fish in the ocean is the whale shark, as you may know. These are animals that can grow to 30 or 40 or maybe even bigger feet in length, so 10 meters or more in length. But they're plankton feeders. They just eat tiny little plankton that's in the water. This is one that I photographed in Mexico that had a big school of fish swimming around it. It was like a living reef around this one's head. This is another whale shark that I photographed in Western Australia. And you know, swimming with an animal like this is just extraordinary. It's like the closest I could imagine being to a dinosaur. You know, you're moving along and this giant animal just swims up alongside of you and it's spotted and kind of bizarre looking, but nothing to be afraid of because they don't eat anything big, just tiny little plankton. So that's part of the story for me as well. But, you know, the truth is sharks have been portrayed as bad guys for a very long time. This is an old painting uh, from the 1850s and it shows people terrified about scary sharks. So a lot of what I try to do today is to show that sharks are not something that we need to be afraid of and that they actually play a very important role in the health of an ecosystem. You know, we've learned this certainly on land. We know that predators 
whether it's wolves in a place like Yellowstone or grizzly bears in Alaska or wherever, you know, polar bears in the Canadian Arctic. I mean, they play an important role in keeping ecosystems healthy and sharks do the same thing in the ocean. So if you want healthy coral on a coral reef, you need to have predators. You need to have healthy sharks because they keep things healthy. They remove the weak and the dead and the dying and, you know, keep the, the gene pool very healthy. And everything has a role in nature. Every little animal and every big animal works in, in harmony. And sharks are an important part of that equation. So everywhere I go, I try to look for stories about sharks. You know, one of the things that I did a few years ago in a story was I spent time in a shark nursery where baby sharks are born because you know we often see the big sort of scary jaws like sharks but we don't often hear about their lives as pups as little babies and i spent a couple of weeks in this place in the bahamas where lemon shark pups are born and they spend the first two to three years of their lives living in these mangrove nurseries the the water is very very shallow it's maybe only a, a foot or so deep and the sharks are maybe only you know, 12 to 18 inches in length. They're very small little baby sharks, but this is where they spend the first part of their lives until they're big enough to go out and compete on the reef as an adult shark. But it's an important part of the story as well. I'm also interested in behaviors whenever I can show an animal, you know, doing some sort of behavior like feeding behavior. This was a Caribbean reef shark that I photographed in Honduras in the Caribbean where scientists had sort of begun to train the sharks, for lack of a better word, train them to begin to eat lionfish, which is an invasive species. Many years ago, lionfish, which is a Pacific Ocean species, got introduced into the Atlantic Ocean and they've sort of just exploded and it's caused a real problem because they eat a lot of baby fish of other species and sharks didn't naturally predate on them. So I was working with some scientists who over the previous years had begun to get them to develop a taste for them. And then they started to naturally eat these lionfish and control the population. So maybe long term, this will be a good solution to that invasive species. But, you know, despite all of this cool stuff that's happening with sharks, sharks are still highly threatened around our planet. You know, for many years now, it's been stated that about 100 million sharks are being killed every year. And in many cases, they're killed just for their fins because people like to eat the sh something called shark fin soup and they, they use the fins for shark fin soup. And that's what's happening here. This mako shark was, was caught and was being finned in Mexico. And, you know, this is another photo I made of a thresher shark that had just recently died in a gill net. And I think that, you know, as a conservation photographer, this is a big part of what I want to do as well because I think it's important for people to have some empathy to understand why sharks are so important and to see that this sort of decimation can't continue. I don't believe we can continue to kill hundreds of millions of sharks every year and expect the oceans to be healthy. And when you consider that every other breath that a human being takes comes from the ocean, more than 50% of the oxygen we're all breathing right now, no matter where you live, uh, comes from the ocean that, you know, we need to keep the ocean healthy and, and sharks are a big part of that. So the stories that I recently did for National Geographic were about four of the top most predatory or most dangerous species of sharks, but I wanted to show them as something that we should celebrate. I'm not trying to portray them as, you know, house pets or puppy dogs. I think they are real predators and we have to be mindful of that, but we can also learn to appreciate them for what they are. So the first one that I wanted to talk about was tiger sharks. This is an animal that's considered the second most dangerous species of shark on earth. It's the most dangerous in tropical waters, but it's an animal that's been portrayed as a monster for so, so long, you know, a mindless sort of one dimensional creature that's just out there waiting to eat anything that it, it, it might swim past. And the truth is that, you know, they have complex lives. This is a baby tiger shark that I photographed in Hawaii. This little guy was only about three or four days old. And when they're first born, they have these really bold, beautiful stripes, this coloration that gives them the name tiger shark because they're 
patterned like a, a tiger on land. But, you know, I wanted people to understand that they're, they're not just born these big, giant, scary animals, that they have difficult lives and they have to compete in the ocean as climate change is affecting their prey. These are things that need to be considered. And one of the places that I did most of my work on this story was in the Bahamas, in a place that we discovered years ago called Tiger Beach. It's in the northern Bahamas, and on any given day, you can go out there and find yourself surrounded by maybe half a dozen or more of these big old tiger sharks. It's a place where you can actually go eye to eye with one of these big animals. This is maybe a 12 or 14 foot long tiger shark. And although this is kind of a scary picture in some respects, I think the message of this picture is that the diver that was facing off with that shark didn't get attacked, didn't get bitten. And even though, you know, there are risks in doing this kind of thing and we have to always be very careful, the truth is you wouldn't do this with a grizzly bear, right? You wouldn't do this with a lion or a tiger, but you can do it, I think, safely with a shark. And even though you have to be very careful, it can be done. And what I think that says is that sharks aren't nearly as bad as they've been portrayed. They are predators. We have to be careful. But... They, they aren't nearly the, the monsters that we've portrayed. And the truth is, so many times when I'm in the water, I see sharks that have this, you know, evidence of intrusion from humans. You know, this was a tiger shark in the Bahamas that had two big steel hooks in the side of her mouth, which was, you know, pretty sad, actually, to see that kind of thing. And a lot of the work that I did on that story was to look at the science that these researchers are doing. This is a group of scientists out of the University of Miami in Florida that are studying sharks. They're led by a scientist named Dr. Neil Hammerschlag, and they're looking at the sharks in the Bahamas to try to learn more about them and then protect them. And one of the things that this woman researcher in the center of this picture with the goggles is doing is she's doing an ultrasound like you would do on a woman that's pregnant to see if this animal has baby sharks inside. And it's been learned because of this research that Tiger Beach, this place in the Bahamas, is actually a maternity ward. It's a place that a lot of pregnant female tiger sharks go before they have their babies. So it's really a very important place in terms of critical habitat that needs to be protected. So I have a little video that shows me working with tiger sharks in the Bahamas that I wanted to share with you. So let's have a look at this. Pretty amazing animals. Well, the next of the four stories that I wanted to share with you uh, that I did on sharks for National Geographic is a story about the short fin mako shark. And you know, I, I love being in the water with all species of sharks. They're, they're all very, very cool in their own way, but there's something really special about a mako. It is just such an amazing predator and just a strong muscular animal. You know, it's a scary animal. I mean, quite frankly, you know, this is probably the last thing a, a yellowfin tuna sees before, you know, they they get attacked by a mako shark, then, which is what they eat. They often eat fish like tuna and, and other game uh, fish species. But, you know, to, to be able to be in the water with an animal like this is pretty extraordinary. And I've never had any problems with them. They, they've always been pretty polite to me, but they are a very impressive animal. This is one that I photographed off of the coast of San Diego, California. And you can see it just has that sort of stout, very muscular body. You know, this is an animal that is considered to be, uh, or is called endothermic, which means they can generate heat in their body. That means their muscles are stronger. They can swim into colder water and feed on oily fish, which gives them even more muscles and, and greater strength. Um, pretty impressive animal when you see one in the water. But, you know, they're always so aware. This was kind of a young mako that I photographed in San Diego, California as well. And you can see he's swimming just below the surface and is so aware. He, his dorsal fin is just maybe an inch below the surface of the ocean on this very calm day. And, you know, easily could have broke the surface and you'd see it if you were on a boat on the surface. But I think this animal is just perfectly aware of the just where he is at all times. And they have those big eyes and they're very aware of me when I'm in the water. 
And again, you know, they are they they are predators. Um, this was a picture I made in New Zealand of a mako that was coming in and sort of mouthing my camera housing. And it is intimidating and it can be a little scary. And as I said, as a journalist, I'm not trying to portray them as something that they're not. I'm trying to say not say that you should go out and hug a mako shark or any of these animals. But I think you know, if we see them in a new light, if we see them as something amazing as predators, maybe we can begin to respect them and, and stop this, this slaughter that's been happening for very many years. And, you know, with this story on mako sharks, I also wanted to focus on some of the mako sharks that are being killed all over the world in sport fishing tournaments. This isn't commercial fishing. This isn't going out and catching them just for their fins like I talked about with commercial fisheries earlier. This is just sport fishermen or sport, you know, recreational fishermen that go out and just catch them often for prize money. And I think it's kind of sad that in a day when, when so many sharks are being lost around the ocean that, you know, there are still places that sort of celebrate the killing of sharks. And I think, you know, I'd like to think that we can do better than that. Maybe we could catch them and tag and release, let them go. But I don't think we need to kill them just for sport, just for, you know, recreation. And I realize that, you know, the best way to see a shark is, is underwater. And I've been very lucky, very privileged to be able to do that. And not everybody will get to do that. But maybe through photography and documentary films, we can learn a lot more about these animals and, you know, create a desire to protect them. The other species of shark, uh, the third story that I did, is on this animal that I mentioned earlier briefly, and that's called the oceanic white tip shark. Now, this is the fourth most dangerous species of shark, if you pay attention to those kinds of lists that sort of rank the most dangerous sharks. But this is an animal that as recently as the 1970s, not that long ago, you know, four or five decades ago, this was an animal that was considered the most abundant large animal on earth. And by large, they meant anything bigger than 100 pounds. So a few decades ago, just a few decades ago, it was the most abundant large animal on earth. And today, they're 99% in decline. There's only 1% of these animals left on planet earth. And we could very easily lose them in our lifetime if we don't protect them. So a few years ago, I went down on a trip to a part of the Bahamas and we discovered a population of them living near a place called Cat Island in the central Bahamas. And to the, for this story, I went back and spent a lot more time there. And here you can see a picture of two oceanic white tips that were swimming around me that day. And the one in the foreground actually has a satellite tag just near its dorsal fin. And that was put on by a scientist before I got there. And the reason for that is that this will stay on for, you know, maybe a month or two months or even three months. And then it pops off and it uploads all of its information, all the data to a satellite, and then it can be downloaded by the scientist, and he or she can then determine where that animal migrated to and from. And in terms of protection, that's really valuable information because these animals are protected in the Bahamas, but if they leave that area, they're vulnerable and they could be caught, and it would be helpful to know where they go to so that we can protect them in those places as well. I have another little video that shows me swimming with these. Let's take a look. All right, perfect day for a swim. Well, the last uh, story that I did of the four shark stories for National Geographic was a story on the great white shark, which I'm sure you've probably all heard of. This is the largest predatory fish in the world. It can grow to lengths of maybe 20 feet or more. We're not quite sure. It, has, it, it can weigh over a ton. It has over 300 big teeth in its mouth that 
constantly replace themselves. So it's got all of these superlatives, all of these amazing things about the great white shark, but yet the truth is it remains an animal of mystery in many regards. There's still so much we don't know about the great white sharks. We, we don't know exactly how many there are in the world. Some scientists think that their numbers are increasing. Other scientists think their numbers are on the decline, that they're you know moving downward in terms of population. We don't know where they go to have their babies, where they migrate to necessarily. In some places, we just have no data at all about them. So it really is an animal that, for all its superlative, still remains largely a mystery to us. And for this story, I worked in two locations. I went to Australia, to South Australia, to work with great white sharks because it was a place that have where great whites have been studied for a long time. So there was a little bit more information about those animals in Australia, but it was also one of the only places in the world where I could work with them on the bottom. Now, all the other shark species that I showed you, I never used a, a shark cage. I was always out in the water with the sharks, but with the great white, I didn't want to do that. I did use a shark cage and Australia was the only place where I could put a cage on the bottom at about 60 or 80 feet because I wanted to get a, a different look. So this is a picture that I had in my mind before I even went there of a shark swimming through this underwater forest, you know, underwater kelp with a, a stingray in the, in the foreground. And my hope is that, you know, when people are looking at the magazine, they see a photo like this, they might want to learn more about that animal. I also worked for the Great White Shark Story near my home in New England on Cape Cod, Massachusetts, where just in the last few years, there's been a newly emerging population of great white sharks. It's probably because of seal populations, which have been increasing over the last few decades, thanks to conservation. In 1972, the United States created something called the Marine Mammal Protection Act, which made it illegal to kill seals or dolphins or whales. And because of that, the seals have been rebounding and with that, the sharks have come back. So hundreds of years ago, there was probably a healthy seal population in Massachusetts and a healthy shark population. But when the seals were all killed many years ago, the sharks went away. And in recent years, the sharks have been coming back. So this is a photo I made of a shark scientist who is working off the beaches of Cape Cod in Massachusetts, trying to do a population study. And what we do is we use a spotter plane to find the sharks from the air. And then we move our boat very close to the shark and gently come alongside of it if, if the shark lets us. And then the scientist here, Greg, will put a little video camera in the water and try to get some video because each of the sharks has different markings and he can determine how many different sharks there are by getting video of each one. So, so far in just the last few years, he's identified over 250 different great white sharks living off these waters in the summertime. And there's probably twice as many as that. And you can also see how close they are to the beach here. So that's a whole different set of issues that people have to think about as well. But, you know, photographically for me, this was a real challenge because the water here is very green, it's murky, and there's a lot of currents. I couldn't put a cage in the water. It was shallow where these sharks were hunting the seals. So it was a real challenge to figure out how to get pictures. The best I could do in the beginning was to just put a camera on a pole on a stick and get sort of a pass by of a shark. And this is all I could get is a, a silhouette. But I really wanted to get a picture of the shark's face so that people knew what these animals looked like. So I ended up making a seal decoy and I put cameras inside of that, both video cameras that I could see in real time what was happening and a still camera that I could fire and get a still picture. And my hope was that the shark would be interested in this decoy and sure enough they were the trick was i didn't want them to eat it you know i wanted them to come close and get near the camera so i could get a picture but i didn't want them to necessarily eat my decoy because then i'd have to do it all over again and sure enough sometimes my decoy got ate, eaten as you see right here this is a great white shark biting down on one of the decoys just maybe 50 yards off the beach 50 meters off the beach here in cape cod and chatham massachusetts so Sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't, but I was able to get some pictures and um, I have a little video here that shows you some of that work with the decoys.
just another day at the beach, right? Huh. Anyway, so using that sealed decoy, which I had to build, I was able to make the very first picture of a great white shark in these Cape Cod waters. And here we see the face of the shark as he's swimming past my decoy. There's a shadow on the sandy bottom floor. He's, he's hunting in very shallow water, which is all new information for scientists. And I think in the time ahead, a lot more will re be revealed about these animals due to these new techniques. So it's an exciting time for shark research. So, you know, for me, spending time in the water is really what it's all about. I want to continue to tell stories about sharks and many other animals because the ocean is such a big part of this planet and we rely on it. And the more we know about the ocean, the better we can protect it. And I believe the better all of our lives will be. So that's my little story about the recent shark work that I've been doing. And I guess with that, I will close the program and go back to where we were. So do I have to now go back to a different uh, tab here? Yeah, just hit the green share screen button again and that should bring you back. Okay. There we go, we got gotcha. you. All righty. All right, well, Brian, thank you so much. That was tremendous. The, oh, good, you're welcome, thanks. Obviously the photos were amazing and even better that you're, you're you know, turning your lens on the sharks to, to give people that different perspective. They don't need to hear all those myths or the, the stories from the media that they're they're actually complicated creatures and they're not yeah. what people think they are. Exactly. That's right. That's a perfect description. Awesome. Excellent. Well, we have classrooms joining in live on camera, obviously. We're going to meet them shortly, but I can see we've got several groups watching us on YouTube as well. So they're on YouTube, there's a YouTube chat sidebar. Let us know who you are and where you're watching from maybe your grade level, that kind of thing. And we'll try and get uh, one or two of your questions in as well. So use that YouTube live chat sidebar. But for now, let's meet some of our live classrooms. So we're gonna start off, let's see. Let's go to Mrs. Shelton's group. They're grade four students in Benicia. I believe that's in California. And I will turn their mic on. How are we doing grade fours? All right, well, who's got a question for Brian? Sit down and introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Joseph. Hi, Joseph. Have you wrong? If yes, how did it feel? Oh, I, um, I, I froze up there. Did you get that, Joe? I lost the first part. Can you go again, Joseph? Go ahead, say it one more time. Have you ever had an experience that went wrong? If yes, how did it feel? Ah, yeah, great question, Joseph. Thank you very much. So the question was, have I ever had an experience that went wrong and how did it feel? Well, I'll, I'll focus on sharks because I guess that's probably your question. And let me say this, that you know I've probably made many hundreds if not thousands of dives with sharks and the vast majority have never been a problem. I think there's been maybe three times, literally three times in my life where the sharks started to get a little too frisky and I didn't feel like it was a safe thing. So I just got out of the water. But, you know, in the time between learning that it wasn't feeling really safe and the time I got out of the water, it was pretty scary, you know? I mean, I was just not feeling really safe. And, you know, I think we all have that little voice inside of us that lets us know when something doesn't feel right. It's like, you know, if you walk into your neighbor's yard and you, you see a dog and one day the dog is wagging his tail and you get a good vibe, you feel like that's okay. And another day you walk in and you just get a feeling that the dog doesn't wanna be bothered or you know you should stay away. And that's the way it is with sharks too. I mean, there's some days where they just seem very relaxed, other days they seem very agitated. And on those days I feel apprehensive and I just get out of the water and you know, have a cupcake on the boat and, and enjoy the day and not worry about it. I'll go back another day. So I've never been really seriously threatened, but there have been days where I definitely knew I shouldn't stay in the water and there's no shame in that. Just get out and go back another time. All right. Good advice. Trust your instincts. Yep. Okay. Let's go to Florida this time. Uh, Mrs. Stouffer's group is joining us uh, and they jumped in a camera spot that opened this morning. So we're super excited to have you guys. And just remind me what grade level you are. We are second yeah, graders. Second grade. Hi. Right. Hi, Florida. Hi. You guys have a question about sharks for Brian? Yeah. 
What is the mo most safest shark you've ever encountered? The safest shark I've ever encountered. Well, there's probably quite a few of them. But the thing that immediately comes to mind, the answer that comes to mind immediately is the whale shark. And that's just because it's such a big, cool animal that I've really, you know, wanted to be with. And I've gone to great exotic locations to find them. And because it's a plankton feeder, because it only eats the tiny little, you know, stuff in the water, um, there was never anything to really be afraid of. And they're very aware of me. I didn't even have to worry about getting run over or bumped in the water or anything. So I would say the whale shark was the one that was the safest for me. But, you know, the truth is there's many other, there's all kinds of little sharks. There's horn sharks and zebra sharks and uh, all kinds of little wabigon sharks and all kinds of stuff that I've never felt the least bit afraid of. So there's many species that I never worried about and felt safe about. But the whale shark is probably the one that immediately comes to mind. All right. And I think I just I think whale sharks are so cool. They can be up to 60 feet long, these yeah. massive creatures, but then they eat just a small little microscopic kind of yeah. Yeah, material like a, in the water. Like a blue whale, you know, the biggest animal that has ever lived on the planet. And they live by eating krill and, and tiny little things. So it's kind of a interesting, um, you know, ironic situation there. Yep. All right. We're going to visit Mrs. Beckett's class now. They're in Paris, Ontario, uh, in Canada, and they join us quite often. Uh, they're a group of students for hangouts. They sometimes just watch live. Let me turn their microphone on. on. How's it going, Paris? Hello. Hi. Hi, y'all. Say hello, honey. Uh, hi, y'all. It's my name. I, I'm sorry. It's my name. Uh, I'm sorry. It's my name. My, um, I'm sorry. What is it? My name is Spencer Yaff William. Hi, Spencer. Hi, Spencer. Hi. Spencer. Hi. How do you how do sharks sheep have your C one sharks sheep in? Um, how sorry. do sharks sleep? Sharks sheep. Sharks sheep. Sharks sheep. Sharks sheep. Sharks sheep. Sharks sheep. Have you seen one sleeping? sleeping. Ah, that's a great that's question, great Spencer. Question. Oh, I'm sorry, was there more to it? No, I think that was it. How okay. do they sleep? How do they sleep? Right. Well, that is actually a really good question, and nobody's ever asked me that, but it's an excellent question. And I would say that it depends on the species of shark. So some sharks actually do sort of sleep. They'll usually go underneath a, like a rocky overhang or, you know, in a little cave in a coral reef, and they sort of go to sleep. So you'll see nurse sharks or different species of sharks sort of hiding in a protected place where nobody can get at them and they go in there and they take a nap and they go to sleep. But there are other sharks that sort of never sleep because they don't have what's called a swim bladder. That means they have to constantly be moving and if they don't keep swimming, they sink. A swim bladder keeps fish and other species of animals in the ocean, you know, buoyant. They can actually float for a while. But some sharks, like the great white shark, doesn't have a swim bladder, so they have to keep swimming all the time. Now, I'm not a biologist, and I'm not certain of this, but I think that they probably can rest. They can probably go into periods where they're maybe very deep in the ocean, and they can sort of rest. But they never truly sleep the way that you and I do. They never actually close their eyes and go to sleep because they always have to keep moving, and they always have to be aware of their surroundings so it's really a great question some sharks can sleep others don't so it depends on the species all right awesome question we're going to jump to another classroom now uh, mrs landrum's class uh they are joining us in kalispell montana let me turn their microphone on how's it going grade twos okay. hi, hi. hi. Hello. Hi, my name is Fenton. Um, I was wondering if you ever worried that you would, that you could hurt accidentally hurt the sh the sharks by um, with, with the plastic seal if they eat it. Oh yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so the question was, did I ever worry about you know being able to hurt the shark using the seal decoy? And yeah, excellent question. I was very concerned about that. And 
That's why we built that decoy. I didn't really have time in my little presentation to, to talk about the construction, but we built it out of neoprene foam and foam rubber inside. So there was really nothing there that could hurt the shark. The camera housing in the very back of the shark, and there was one time where the shark bit it and it, it you know, its tooth went through the, the dome port of my housing, which flooded the housing, but it didn't hurt the shark in any way. You know, we were very careful about that. I was working with scientists who study sharks, and we wanted to make sure that, you know, there was no way that the shark could, could get hurt or, you know, swallow the thing or anything like that. Every time that a shark did bite the decoy, it made one bite, and then it let go and swam away. It was really amazing to watch. It's, it, you know, those sharks really knew that that was not their natural prey. You know, I think when they bite a seal, they, they know that's the real thing. But in this case, the second they bit down and tasted, you know, rubber or whatever, foam, they knew that it wasn't real and then they just swam away and left it there. But the construction of, it, of the thing itself, the decoy itself, was unable to harm the shark. So, yeah, good question. Awesome question. Nice to hear a student worried about the shark safety. So that's yes, cool. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Mrs. Green's class, they're grade fours there in Calgary, Alberta. This is their first hangout. Let me turn their microphone on. Hey, grade fours, how are you? Oh, I just don't hear you. Can your teacher just check to make sure the microphone's on on your side? Hmm. It was working when you first came in. There we go. Oh, 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 we gotcha. Oh. All right, go ahead. Hi, my name is Talia, and the question I have for you today is how did you get, well, how did you become interested in being a marine uh, photojournalist? Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. So how did I become interested in becoming a, a marine photojournalist, an ocean photographer? You know, um, I fell in love with the sea as a child. I think from a very young age, my parents used to take me to the beach and I just really found the ocean a, a place of great mystery and a place that was waiting for discoveries to be made. So from the early days that I can remember, I just wanted to be an ocean explorer. I wanted to be a scuba diver and I wanted to explore the ocean and swim with dolphins and whales and sharks and explore shipwrecks and do all those cool kinds of things. And I started scuba diving when I was about 15 years old. And then it was maybe a year after that that I attended a diving show, a conference in Boston. And I saw photographers and filmmakers presenting their work. And I remember just you know, I described it as an epiphany. I just sort of, the light bulb went on in my head and I said, that's the perfect way for me to explore the ocean. I want to do it with a camera. You know, I loved good stories. I loved movies and books and magazines. I think I was a very visual person. And the idea of using a camera to explore and then share with others what I, what I learned just seemed like a perfect job for me. But, you know, I'll admit it, it was a very lofty dream. I came from a little working class town. It was filled with textile mills. There was nobody around that did what I did. I didn't know any divers. I didn't know any photographers. The idea of swimming with sharks or whales was about as foreign as going to the moon. So I really had to, you know, figure out a, a way to do that. And ultimately, as I said, became a scuba diver. I, I went to college. I studied photography and science and photojournalism. And then I came out and just sort of chipped away at becoming a, a photographer, eventually getting that job with National Geographic 20 years ago. But but it, it all started from, you know, just being a kid with a, a big dream about exploration in the ocean. All right, excellent. And I think this is a good spot to bring up that if there's something you want, you gotta go after it. You gotta take a chance and um, sometimes Absolutely. push those doubts behind you. Don't listen to the people who say uh, okay. it won't be easy and go for it. Yep, that's right. All right. Our final li live classroom is Mr. Chitaro's class. They're in Windsor, Ontario, grade nine students. Let me turn their microphone on. How are we doing grade nines? Hi, everybody. Wait, hello. Hi. 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 <laughs> um, what is your opinion on zoos and aquariums? My view on zoos and aquariums also, these are all really great questions today. Um, 
You know, I would say that my views on zoos and aquariums are that they can serve a really vital role. I think that zoos and aquariums can do excellent work. The, most of the, the more prominent ones today are doing great work in conservation. They're doing you know, captive breeding uh, programs. They're sending researchers out into the field. They're funding that kind of research. What I don't think is appropriate is you know, keeping certain animals, particularly you know, since my world is the ocean, I don't think it's appropriate to keep certain animals in captivity that just don't really do well in captivity. I think there's a lot of animals that, if given the right amount of space and stimulation, can do very well. But certain things like marine mammals, I don't believe that you know whales or, or dolphins do very well in, in captivity. Uh, for those that are already in captivity, if it's possible to you know reacclimate them and rewild them, maybe that's an option. If not, then giving them the absolute best care. You know, these are social animals that need a lot of cognitive sort of stimulation. So there are places where that can be done effectively, but I'm absolutely against, you know, going out and, and capturing wild animals like dolphins and them in captivity today. I just don't think that, you know, that that's at all appropriate. But, you know, with certain species of fish or invertebrates and other things, I think that zoos and aquariums can do a good job of education. I realize that a lot of people uh, in the world and cities and so forth don't necessarily have the ability to get out into the wild places and see these things. So for education, it can, can be a really viable uh, option, but I think it has to be done effectively. It has to be done with the animal welfare in mind and um, that it, it can be a, a solution for education and um, conservation if it's done correctly. All right, excellent. Um, and a very good answer. And I think we're, I think we're finally kind of smartening up and realizing these big marine mammals can't, uh, can't be in captivity anymore. So that's, right. that's good. Uh, so we visit our live classrooms, but we should jump in online. Um, hmm. We have Ava and Elizabeth, they're from New Orleans and they're wondering, um, well, first of all, they're in awe of your work and your mission, but they're wondering for some advice for an aspiring marine photographer. Yeah, well, hi guys. Hi in New Orleans. Um, I would say that, yeah, my advice to aspiring marine photographers is to realize, or this, and this goes for pretty much any photographer, certainly a wildlife photographer. I think it's, it's to realize and understand that if you want to do kind of what I do, and that is, you know, be an assignment photographer for a magazine, that the more tools you can bring to bear, the better your chances are of getting a job, but that ultimately you will either be hired or maybe not hired depending on your portfolio. So a portfolio is just a collection of some of your best work, your best photographs. And in the old days, it was a three ring binder with you know eight by 10 photographs, maybe 20 or 30 photos. Today it could be, today it could be on an iPad or it could be a link to a website that you give to an editor of a magazine, but ultimately they are gonna to wanna to see that you can do two things really, that you can make beautiful pictures, really interesting, compelling photos, and that you can shoot journalistically, that you can tell a story through a visual narrative. So whatever you have to do to get to that point from where you are today is really what's gonna be necessary. So some of the things that you can do, of course, is to, to take curriculum in school, whether it's high school or college, and learn photography, learn photojournalism, learn all the fundamentals of photography, lighting, and you know, even a studio lighting classroom is gonna be uh, some knowledge that you might use, even if you're out photographing you know, sharks and whales, you're not gonna be using studio lighting, but those techniques might come in handy somewhere. So, getting as much education as you can, taking workshops, reading books, and, and absolutely getting out and doing your own personal projects. You know, one of the things that I think is really helpful is for a young emerging photographer to, to, to sort of design their own assignments in their own backyard. You know, one of the mistakes that a lot of photographers make when they're starting out is they save up all their money and they buy some camera equipment and then they save up all their money and they go to some exotic place because they want to emulate the work of somebody whose work they admire. 
But the truth is, unless you're independently wealthy or have endless sources of, of money, you're not going to be able to stay in that place very long. So, you know, if you go to Australia for a week or two, that might sound great, but you're not really going to be able to compete with somebody who can spend three months there. But what you can do better than anybody else is work in your own backyard. So is there a story, you know, in New Orleans? Is there a story in the Gulf of Mexico or in some local estuary that you can go back to day after day or weekend after weekend and really get those pictures right? You know, maybe you work with a scientist or a researcher at a local university or an environmental person or a conservation worker or a farmer or a fisherman, whatever it is. But you tell that story that you know better than anybody else. And if you do that several times over a period of years, then you can take the best images of each of those coverages, put them together in a portfolio, and then you can go meet with the big magazines, the National Geographics or the other magazines that might be interested. But what you will have done during that period is you will really have honed your skills. You've learned to deal with all kinds of people from fishermen to PhD scientists, and you will have really built a portfolio that will be of interest to the, the editors of the big magazine. So design a strategy and realize that that's what's going to get you that job at the end of the day. All right. Excellent. Some good advice. Uh, so, Brian, we're about at the time where we should uh, stop for today. That was so good. And I know the classrooms have so many more questions. So if you have a couple more minutes, maybe after we log off, just uh, to sure. visit with the classrooms for a few minutes longer, we'll do a little after hours Q&A. Yeah. Um, but some are going to have to run uh, okay. for, for their next classes. But again, Brian, that was so great today. It was a great okay. presentation, such great photos. And I know the classrooms loved it. Um, well, it's my pleasure, Joe. And, and you know, I'm, I'm thankful to everybody for tuning in. I hope um, everybody came away with a little bit of something. And um, yeah, if, you, if you're not able to stick around here right now and ask a question, feel free, free to reach out to me. You can follow me on social media, Instagram and so forth. And, you know, let's keep this conversation going. I think it's important that we all work to saving our planet. All right. Excellent. Well, again, thanks so much. Classrooms, your questions were excellent today. We are going to log off uh, from the live stream, but if you stick around, if you can, uh, we'll squeak in another couple questions. So thanks so much, Brian. Thanks everybody for tuning in and we're going to sign off for today. Classrooms, your microphones are on nice and loud. Goodbye and thank you. Goodbye. Bye. 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 All right. Thanks everyone.